Welcome to the After Hours Podcast, hosted by Harry Haas and James Friedlender, presented by My Investing Club. What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of the After Hours Podcast. Uh, today, we have Johnny uh, in chat. His name is Bomb Ticky Ticky, so you will notice him in there. Uh, so thank you for coming on, man. What's going on? Yeah, man, not much. It's midnight good, here. Good. <laughs> Dude, I, I think that's psychopathic that you trade it. You're, it's midnight and we are trade. Where are you? I mean, Australia? Just, well, yeah, I'm in Australia. So like <laughs> on average, I'm sleeping around 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. So my <laughs> sleeping pattern is right at the point, but I love the fucking norm. I love the like the passion for this shit, but good for you. Like, you and people <laughs> like Austin, dude. I don't know how the fuck you guys do. He's in Hawaii and it's like damn you must really love this shit so so really props to you yeah i mean you get used to it after like the first you know three weeks of it or so yeah no for for sure for sure so anyways we'll dive into it so i guess we'll start off in old-fashioned you know how did you get in the trading how did you find it and then how did you eventually find mic yeah so i think for me i was kind of the perfect victim to be set up to take a, a huge loss on my first trade and it was mainly because of my mindset going into trading. Um, I was really profit focused and I was kind of, I was in my second year of uni doing mechanical engineering. And I said to myself, like, this can't be it. Like I need to, I need to find a way out of it somewhere, but I had no idea what I was going to do. And it was not until my brother actually introduced me to like the whole idea of trading that I started to get into it. And that was around about like three years ago now. So December, 2018. And from that point on, it was kind of just deep dive into as much YouTube content as I could find. Um, kind of bounce around from place to place. I landed up like, I think, yeah, I ended on Tim Sykes mm -hmm. and I watched like all his stuff or a lot of it. And then from then on, I actually found Tim Gratani and uh, Stephen okay. Ducks. Oh, yeah, super, yeah. Uh, to this day, like, training is really good DVD, uh, which is yeah, actually where I started. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I started with that. I, I watched that, like, five times. And from that moment on, that was when I could really see, you know, like, this is something that I could learn uh, and that I could actually master if I spent enough time with it. Um, and that was my first time seeing, you know, like, like real in the moment, uh, trading and what it's actually like yeah so after that uh i went to ducks's uh chat room because tim didn't have one at the time and i was like i'm just gonna learn as much as i can from this guy and what i found from observing them was yes i was seeing heaps of massive pnls being made but to me i'd never even known about potential losses that i could make so I'm seeing these like 70K, 70K in one day, like 35K in one day. But the risk to make that uh, was just non-existent in my mind. Yeah. So um, the first day when I'm about to trade, I still remember it. It was, it was like took an FTNW three years ago and I'm just so eager to get into it. Like I'm so eager to start. And I remember saying to myself, oh, well, Tim and Ducks go in like 100,000 shares. So let me just go in something small. Let me just go in like one-tenth of that, which is like 10,000 shares. I was going to say, that's still a lot of shares. <laughs> hey, I'm like, oh, this is like tiny size. Like Tim, Tim was adding I like see, yeah, yeah. At the time, 20,000 yeah. pop in his trading ticket. So I'm like, this is nothing. I mean, if you um, don't know like size in the market, like yeah. you think it's like nothing, but like 10 cents on 10,000 shares is a grand and you're like, wait a second. And then 50 cents are like, oh, fuck. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. All right. So much risk that goes with it. But in my head, 10 cents on 10,000 shares was a $1,000 gain for me. So yeah. That's all. Yep. And what actually happened when I went to locate the shares was the locate fee was like 400 bucks. And like for me, who never spends anything, I see that, and I'm like, like yeah, there ain't no way I'm paying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I want to enter it, but like, oh, that's way too much because I mean, convert that to Australian dollars at the yeah, time, yeah. it was like bucks uh, for a lucky fee. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to sit back and I'm just going to watch watch the trade play out and see what happens. 
And like, I kid you not, it was, it was the most perfect short you could ever have. Like, perfect bounce. <laughs> and it just dropped like a dollar and 10 cents a share and just faded off for the rest of the day. And everyone in the chat was posting their game. Like, Ducks made like 80K on it. Yeah, of course. Right? <laughs> 7K. And I have no idea like what these people's account sizes are, but I'm just yeah. seeing, seeing the numbers that, that are on the screen. And I'm like, and I'm thinking about, oh, like if I had just gone in with 10,000 shares, which is way yep. too big for my account size at the time, like I could have made 11, 11K on this. So yeah. in my head, I'm now I've got so much FOMO and it really just came back to bite me the very next day because I go into the market and like, lo and behold, is a ticket gapping up. One that we all know really well, BPTH, the Black Swan. Oh. <laughs> Holy fuck. Oh, no, I don't like where this is going, bro. Oh, no. And it, was, it was on the day before, it, it was the day of the Black Swan move. Oh. And I'm you know, like, guns blazing, like, just full of FOMO, thinking about, I need to make that 11K that I missed out on yesterday. But this time I'm prepared. This time I'm only going to go in 3,000 shares, oh. which is huge for like, an, like a $7 stock. Um, so I remember straight out of the gate, it's, it's around 780. And on the daily level, there, yeah, there was, there was an, an $8 level, which had like 100 million volume traded on that day. So for Ducks, that was like unbreakable resistance. So like you should... Like on the day, it should reach eight bucks and it shouldn't break through just because of the amount of volume that trailed the day previously. And me not doing anything, you know, this was a micro flight. I just slam it at the first sign of weakness. So I open at 780, it slams down at like 774. I just slammed everything in thinking, oh, like, I don't want, I'm not going to miss the move this time. Like I saw what happened yesterday and I expected the same thing to happen. Of course, we know it didn't. Like immediately <laughs> popped. 780s and now i'm down 300 bucks and this is the first try i've ever made and i'm coming in with the expectation to see like a big green number there and now i'm staring at like a loss and at that moment i kind of freeze i'm like oh, okay it's still underneath eight dollars like well, i'll just hold it see what happens and i haven't even placed a hard stop in um mm. i'm just expecting that i'll be able to manual stop it when the time comes it doesn't happen <laughs> And all of a sudden, the chat room starts going crazy. And everyone's saying, like, Guy Gentile just bought the float. Guy Gentile just bought the float. And I remember looking at it. And I looked back and my stomach just sank as there was a huge green candle from, uh, like, 780s to, like, 840s. Oof. And I just learned my loss, like, 2.2K. And at that moment, I just free. I don't know what to do. I'm, like, I'm a deer in headlights at this point. And... This is one that just gave no relief for shorts. Uh, instantly another huge squeeze up to uh, 880s and I cut it. Like, thank God I cut it there because it did go to yeah, like, did. 74. Yeah. Uh, later on the <laughs> but that, Jesus, was, dude. that was my first experience with uh, with trading. Um, and I had a big loss of shit <laughs> after yeah, two dude. months. Cutting, that's I pretty normal. That's more short. normal than you probably think though. That, that I talked to a lot of people who like, very early they take some dumb big loss it's just you happen to pick like one of the worst squeezes of all time to try it on but, but i think that's just like luck right i mean that's yeah. that could be anyone technically so so from yeah. here you took that loss i'm sure your confidence is like shot to shit because i know if that were me i would be like fuck <laughs> like i can't do this how did, what did you do <laughs> next like where did you go from there so immediately what i did was i went into my room and i typed in how to deal with trading losses <laughs> alcohol drugs wait did you say farmer is that what you said it was yeah it was farmer that came up as the first video oh and dude <laughs> oh my god <laughs> so I had the first first <laughs> but yeah from that moment on i pulled i pulled my size way back and i really just focused on learning the setups and knowing how much I'm going to lose before I go into the trade. Now with MIC, I actually didn't uh, find out about that until two months later when someone was posting this person's chart in the room and this guy was getting like bottom tech, top tech, bottom tech, top tech. And I'm like, like who the fuck is this guy? 
Yeah. <laughs> I think it was some. I think his name was like Sniper Trader Twenty One. If that rings. Oh, it was oh, oh, like so an Harry. I thought it was Bell. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, so it was actually it was Harry Shark that had Sniper been posted Trader. into <laughs> and there were there were like quite a few of them. I think it was like D A R E first bounce was one of them. Oh really? And then so, I they were, to- so they were looking at my charts in the duck chat room. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. So everyone. Everyone was viewing your charts, and I just immediately went on on like Twitter, like got to check this guy out. Um, saw all your charts, and then I just saw like first bounce, first bounce, yeah. MIC, and I'm like, I'm just no brainer. I just clicked. I'm like, yeah, okay, like I'm gonna sign up and see what this is about. That's awesome. Yeah, so I joined MIC, and this was when like I don't think Tom Diesel was even in at this point. Um, it was pretty early on. Those are good days. Um, but I remember going through like as many as i could how what oh no he, so those said, good days. I, he said those are good days <laughs> Tom, oh, yeah. said Tom, <laughs> yeah, my nose. okay anyway keep going. um yeah so i watched like all of harry's stuff all of your stuff james that you had out at the time i think you were just making like there were like three videos out i think yeah and, and um and then the time for the first bounce came and it was like that was you remember it, Harry, like the legendary OPTT. Oh my god, bounce. that was epic. Major throwback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you that was... down memory lane today. Bro, man, that trade, <laughs> there were a couple trades where I was in uni and uh we had these like study groups. And so for that particular like OPTT one, um we had I had like 10 to 20 people that were just fucking constantly watching me trade. Because I, at that point I was like, oh well, I'm making money. Like, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm able to trade during class now. So that's basically what I would do. And so um, I remember that one was in the morning, and uh, I had this like for whatever reason 8:30 study group, and absolutely no one fucking studied. Everyone was just watching me trade this. So I remember I, I called out like everyone was like, oh, what's your watch list? Like, what's your, what's your plan on this? So I was like, all right, boys, setting up for first bounce, let's go. And I remember just writing in the MIC chat. You can probably find it in the archives, like, all right, first bounce coming, first bounce coming. And I did not expect it to do that. It had, like, moved down a little bit, like, got off the, like, notch, started building back up, and it, like, stalled for a little bit. And, like, I was already in, like, decent size. And I was like, oh, should I cut it? Should I not? And everyone's like, don't cut it. What are you talking about? So I'm like, all right, boys. (laughs) I won't cut it. Stop loss for break even. And all of a sudden, this thing just rips. And everyone behind me was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all, right. all I remember, yeah. So after it ripped, and then it was like you sending your average from literally like the notch. And then yeah. 10 minutes later, you're like, you're like, boom, I'm done. Yeah. Boom, I'm done. <laughs> I miss the first bounce days. Those used to, some of those used to like fucking rip, dude. At the oh open, like I remember God. like the good 100%. first bounce days. Oh, those are awesome. So did you trade that? Did you trade OPTT as well? Um, I was too scared to pull the trigger on that because I, I yeah. like, I was still, I still had PTSD for my big loss and like, I had just learned it. So I was kind of just on the sidelines and I remember having my finger on the trigger, but when yeah. the time came, I was too scared to, to actually enter. Well, especially when you, and this is the problem with me when I first started longing, like I know you do mostly shorts now, but um when I first started longing I had learned all this short material and you like condition yourself to believe that stocks cannot go up like you literally like I don't even know what it was when I was learning how to short but I was like oh this can't do this like this is impossible shit company they have dilution they have warrants they have resistance on the daily I'm like nope can't go up can't go up and then you get stubborn and stubborn and stubborn blown out and then that's when the real move obviously comes and so I think as a long, I've just been, because I had that kind of short background first and that kind of conditioning as a short seller, I know when shorts are in trouble and I know when situations are happening where it's like, okay, this stock should have died a long time ago. Now I'm going to start looking for this long position. Like for example, yesterday we had Rally, which was a ticker that was red on the day. And, you know, we had broken red to green. We had came back. At that point, it, the, 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 you know, it should have died, right? But 
we yeah. started creeping and creeping and now all of a sudden we're green again on the day i know a ton of people are probably short underneath that red to green level or at least risking it and we just started ripping above it and you know that's what made a great long right it's just understanding the other side of the of the trade and and who's trapped you know and i think that particularly has you know benefited me a lot as far as like my journey and what i've kind of done definitely if i walk too long then that's the approach i'd take yeah because whenever i'd think about long i'd only think about uh where would the majority of the shorts be entering where would they be willing to risk yeah and if they were to get pushed to max pain where would yeah. that be and then yeah. kind of basically basis of that like 100 percent organic ideas that form real time yeah yeah 100 percent. yeah i and it's so hard and difficult to say every morning like what the long watch list is because you could have three stocks doing amazing volume and yes you have the support and yes you have all that but if the stock pops and does an insane fucking stuff move down you don't want to necessarily be longing that support line you may get a little bound yeah. but it's not really what you want. And then all the money flow, you know, switches to this one. And, you know, your supports from the bottom are completely thrown out the window. It's never going to get there because everyone's kind of buying this one now. So that's what has kind of been difficult for me. As far as low hanging fruit, it's a lot easier because number one, the stocks are dead. And you kind of have an if then scenario of, okay, if this pops here, then we're going to get in a situation where we probably see some sellers at like whatever, 750, whatever. And then the stock tanks again, you know, it's a lot easier, I think, to do something like that than, you know, okay, I'm looking to go along this one or that one. And even in a market like this, like for me, at least the hot chicks have not been that great. Like I've been longing other shit because, um, I mean, for I like me, longing day two shit. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Because, um, I've found that you know, the, the day one tickers have been really choppy. They're not great for shorts. They're not great from longs. They're not really directional for me. You know, like if you look like some, at something like, uh, I don't know what the ticker yesterday that I stocked or whatever, but you know, we're literally in a, a chop, chop, chop range. And for me, I mean, I really got into longing because like, I love the adrenaline and I love the big moves and I love being able to get in early and, and it's the massive those. Potential. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so when I'm in a situation where it's just range bound and choppy and every single time we break high day, we stuff and go lower. Like, I just don't like that trading environment. I, I just feel like it's not really like friendly for me, but when I can get into something like rally where everyone's like, it has to go down, it has to go down, it has to go down. And we're frigging squeezing everyone out. That is the most rewarding feeling for me. And I feel like that's yeah. been kind of really important for me as well. Just recognizing situations like that. Yeah. Just with what you're saying, I feel the same way about the hot shake, not being the one that ends up having a huge move to the upside, just because everyone really just expects it to happen. Yeah. Um, so like in a way the market kind of doesn't let it happen, but we've been getting these, broken stocks which are really broken really deviated from vwap and then all of a sudden you know they'll just uh teleport counter right through vwap and then just continue from there yeah I, I think i think it's hard and i i give like longs more credit for this but like i think it's really tough when people want like a long watch this harry because like i feel like most of longing like everyone just assumes like if like when my friends get into trading or they want to they look at like the top gainers list. So all they see is the hot chick, which we see. And they're like, oh, this has to be it. This is going to go to 50. Like I had a buddy the other day text me. He's like, this stock got FDA approval. Like this is going to go to 50. And I'm like, yeah. that's nothing that I guarantee you. Like Harry and the other guys aren't even thinking about longing that shit because no. it's a short. <laughs> I know everybody's hitting the first. We're hitting it. So I think it's tough because it's a long. It's a lot more feel too. It's like a, a broken stock. Like if it starts firming up at a certain level. Yep. Like, that's a lot of feel. That's a lot of, like, there's no technical part to that, I feel like. And it's, like, sure, like, if you want to be, like, a technical long, you say, yeah, I'm going to long if it breaks this level and, and you know, get out of it, goes back under. But, like, it just doesn't work that way, especially in this market. I don't think it's very it's very much more feel and, like, you know, uh, longing the stocks that everyone's kind of avoided. I mean, everyone's just, like, dumped in short, I guess. And, like, it's going to get squeezed out because yeah. it's so broken. Yeah, those are like my the favorite. One that should have broken down, but don't break down. And yeah. then mm -hmm. went. Yeah. 
you know, that's where everyone gets trapped now. I think, I feel like the edge has changed so much because I feel like when we first got into trading Harry too, like longing, I think was, I think it was harder back then. Cause I think like a lot of stuff, we just had faders all the time. Like, I think yeah. it was much more as a long, it was a, you very much had to be nail and bail. Like it was a much more scalping mentality. And, and I feel like now it's like with the, with the resurgence of like being a short seller, like yeah. that, that has like that has revitalized a longing and that's kind of when you switch to longing too is when you when shorting became like the only popular thing to do yeah and like i mean i was going back the other day looking at like times like alex has like mentioned me on twitter just like going back for the old tweets just because i was bored and you know i saw this one chart for me it was like igc where i just shorted the pop and covered the bottom and he's like oh great trade from harry here and it's like that was the time where i was shorting uh, but I was also learning longing, you know, like I was, I was, I was still yeah. shorting. I was still consistent shorting, but I was also learning, okay, how, how do I get into longing? Uh, you know, how do I uh, kind of look to attack some of these stocks on the long side? And we hear every new year's people on Twitter, uh, 2022 going to be uh, the year of the long. I'm going to learn long <laughs> this year. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they realize yeah. longing's hard and then they stop longing. And it's like, um, a lot of people, I think, picture longing as like the dumb money, which is is fine for me. Like, that's great. Like, but just know that, like, you know, I'm going to be there when you're you're starting to fight. Like, I'm going to recognize gonna that off. and I'm going to take advantage of that. Right. I do think the majority of longs are dumb money. You know, they, they are. Um, you know, I think shorts are probably significantly more smarter just because they realize all these stocks are shit and they suck. You know, already you have an edge on everyone who thinks that the FDA approval and they, you know, and all this news is actually true and, and not a scam because it is. But, you know, I just take yeah. advantage of those times where that smart money, quote unquote, starts to, you know, act dumb. And, um, you know, that's really what I've made my trading career kind of based off of is just people fighting. It's the same thing with shorts, you know. You have a ton of longs who have long the high who are just trying to exit on this pop, on this stuff, on this whatever. And then they just get insanely, insanely crushed. And that's how you can just take advantage of the short side. It's really just taking advantage of that kind of crowd, I think, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so, just, so Johnny, at this point, now you're in MIC. What is your kind of focus now? Like, where, where are you focused? So my focus has shifted. Um, I'm also still here. Bit. I just need to, I need to send a text real quick, but I'm still here. <laughs> oh yeah. So I shifted quite a bit. I think in the earlier days, I needed to go through those phases of prioritizing like a high win percentage yep. and low risk reward trades, just so I can get, you know, learn how to get my initial entries done really well, learn how to get into areas and to strength if you're shorting. But mostly just know that uh, that I can actually, you know, pull money from the market. Um, but the problem with that was that it wasn't really scalable. Like every time I try to size up, there would be something that goes wrong. And I found that it was always just due to my, my average loser being bigger than my average win. Yeah. So I really needed to find a way to, you know, to fix that. Um, so after doing that for about, you know, one year, uh, cause it's not, a, it's not an easy switch. No. Uh, I just said to myself, okay, I need to make a plan with uh, how I'm going to transition from being uh, focused on like nail and bell plays yeah. to yeah. Uh, plays like, like beer, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Um, and I think there's definitely a time and place to nail and bail uh, for broken, like broken day ones, especially, but I've tried to kind of narrow down what I trade to uh, like a select few setups where I know for certainty over a long period of time, I can get consistently uh, at least three R on the trade. And I think the biggest thing that kind of helped me with this transition and with sizing up in general is just completely switching the way that I think to where I fully accepted losing in every aspect before the trade and especially while I'm in the trade, uh, while I have unrealized gains there. Um, and not even to a point where I've lowered myself to break even, you know, like if I have, if I'm unrealized 1R, 1.5R, 
and the trade is still on. I'm, I'm fully uh, accepting of that to just go back and stop me out for a loss. And the way that I really strengthened that was um, because it wasn't easy. Like I was, I'm like, initially I was a profit focused trader. All I cared about was, you know, I had this image in my head of I need to make X amount of money every day. And I've kind of switched that to whenever I think about trading in like any time of the day, the only thing on my mind is like red losing numbers or taking losses. So when I think about uh, a trade that I've done or I analyze it, the only thing on my mind at, at like any point is how much I'm going to lose if I'm stopped out, if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And the more you kind of do that, the more it, it sort of strengthens in your pathways in your brain that associate, you know, these negative emotions that come along with losing and with giving back unrealized gains. Uh, but I think that aspect alone, you know, it helps mentally and, but it wasn't enough. Like it wasn't enough. Right. So I needed to figure out like what else I needed to do. Um, so the first thing was that I had to have, uh, my initial entries pretty much mastered. So I'm going to enter a trade. Firstly, it needs to be one with like enough downside range, which at the time kind of is only shorting first red day or shorting day twos that have just had a massive move on day one. Cause then I have like the downside range to be able to, to be able to get the move and to be able to add. So I really just had a huge focus on getting my initial entries right. And then once we do get uh, a confirmation move, so I take the initial entries uh, sort of into strength. If it's a first red day, I won't short it if it pushes right and open until it drops below VWAP. Because I, I don't know how high it's going to go. Like, I don't want to pick the top. And the majority of my size is going to come after it goes red anyway. So I don't need to be in. I don't need to be trying to get the top. So what I, what I did was... I just waited for the top to be set. I waited for it to have that first pull. If it bounced, like I leave it alone uh, until we get like the big VWAP crack, which is where, you know, that's at like, the first point that I'm really looking to enter. Um, and that's where like, I need to switch on and just be in that complete mentality of how much am I gonna lose? Where am I stopping out if I'm wrong? Um, so like in doing that, I'd take my first entry into VWAP and I'd risk one R on that trade. And before going into it, I've said to myself and I repeat it over and over and over again, like minus this amount, minus this amount, minus this amount. So I'm in a way I'm already accepting it and my brain is accepting it as mm -hmm. a huge possibility that it might happen. Mm -hmm. If the trade stops me out, then I lose one R and I don't care because at this point I've traded my brain just continuously to prepare for this moment when I do lose. So I have no FOMO to re-enter. Uh, I can just take the loss and if it sets up, I'll take the trade again. If it doesn't, well then like I'll just walk. Mm -hmm. But if it does work and I'm now in risking my one R um, and you know, we do get that continuation move down to red green. I have to just completely like continuously repeat in my head the amount that I'm risking. So I don't think about the PL because if I think about how much I'm up, I will take something off. Like I'll just do it. And it will be at like a level where I shouldn't need to take it off. Um have you ever and, thought about just taking like just partial and then just like holding the rest like with trailing stop? Because I know that once that's I helped do, a lot of people. Once I do get the second ad, so at that point it still hasn't confirmed like red green, but if I, it does slam through, I get the bounce and I get that ad. Like at that point, I will lower my stop. Um, pretty much, yeah, like I do trail it with every single ad that I do. I'll have a separate stop that uh, I'll put it there and that's kind of like the area where it shouldn't reach. So for like this specific ad, if it reaches here, then my thesis isn't validated for having like that ad down here. So as I'm like entering stop, like entering and adding to the winner, I kind of just um, have multiple stops out there, uh, still while risking like the same amount. And yeah, I, I've only just started doing that where I'll take out like, I'll limit order out 
like two percent of my size so my brain thinks that i'm like i'm covering like a decent portion and like i'm locking something in but i'm still able to get uh like the majority of the move with like a big amount of my size but just as it's like going down as it's continuing i'm just limit ordering out like two percent two percent five percent paying myself and like i have to i have to like limit order all the commissions will just add up like crazy yeah um but the main thing that like really just helped me to improve was fully accepting losses uh and fully accepting the fact that i can give back all my unrealized gains but like you need to be at a point where you're confident in your system and you're confident that if you do take, you know, three losses in a row, five losses in a row, uh, you can make them, you can be profitable in two trades. And like, for me, that was just journaling my trades. I actually did it like, like your friend, Harry, um, like Jack Hallow journals his ones. Yeah. Uh, Cause I would rather do that than trade of you. Like I like them putting them manually just because in my head, it's kind of like I'm going through the trade again and then mm -hmm. like visualizing it all. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is that you get to see your average win and average loss over, you know, at least, I'd say at least nine months, just so you can experience like all the market cycle shifts. Mm -hmm. um, but once you know that, that was the, that was the big uh, deciding factor that made me okay with losing multiple times in a row. Because I know that, you know, I can I can be profitable in two trades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think. So I, uh, I, I have a question actually. Um, how did you adjust yourself from the way you were trading before with like trying to trade massive size to like what you're trading now? Because obviously back then you were shorting too. So like, how did yeah. you how did you adjust that? That that's got to be kind of a tough adjust adjustment. Um. Yeah. Well, that. I actually, over the course of probably a year, I attempted to size up 11 times. And each time wow. that I did it, it was like I was cursed or something. Like everything would just break pre-market high of day or I'd get like a VWAP confirmation and then it would just have like a huge stuff work that would like top tick me. And I'd end up giving back like three or four days worth of gains. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, it was just insane. And like, I remember one point, because I'd been consistent for six months and it's like, okay, like now's the time to size up. And then I size up and then nothing works. And I remember messaging Bao and I'm like, like I just lost like 10 times in a row. And then he's like, how do you lose 10 times in a row? <laughs> <laughs> and, it's such a <laughs> I don't know what just happened. I it was round about like, um, like the seventh time that I sized up and I lost. That's when like I, I reached out to Harry and I'm like, dude, like I just keep giving back everything that I make. Um, like I need help. And then Harry did help me. Yeah, what did I um, say? I can't remember. Like you sent some paragraph that ended off with like you saying like, yeah, I can tell that you already knew this. Like you know what to do. And I was like, yeah, like and I just size down again just mm -hmm. um well i mean attempted to size up four more times until like finally like it really was just that whenever i'd enter if i did size up it would always be me scaling a range so mm -hmm. the actual amount that i'm going to lose was unknown like i knew that i'd lose around uh this amount but uh, I was kind of always hoping that it wouldn't get there. Like I'm scaling these lines. I'm like, please don't get to my final order. Like, oh shit, it hit me. And then like, oh shit. <laughs> please don't hit me. <laughs> yeah. I've been there. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to um, add, uh, if because like we are coming up on the, the end of the kind of like 30, 45 minute mark or whatever. Um, and I just want to add like a couple of things that I think could help you. Um, and so basically at the start of every trading day, I always pay attention to the range of a ticker, right? So if the high is $5 and the low is $4, you don't want to be shorting near four bucks, right? You know, you, you want to be shorting near, and sometimes we can see a range right to the downside where $4 breaks with authority and then we go to three or whatever, right? But for the most part, as a general rule, you don't really want to be shorting four bucks. 
And so I've always kind of pictured it as like, where are the areas of like liquidity, right? Where we're going to have a lot of liquidity because the whole thing to me has always been a liquidity game. And so let's say the high is five, the low is four. And, you know, where's the first kind of area of liquidity going to be? Well, VWAP, let's say is at 450. That's going to be the first area of liquidity, right? Every single long trader is going to be chasing for that VWAP reclaim, thinking we're going to the moon, we're, we're going, let's go. That would probably be where I would want to put some starter size on short because I just know that this is just liquidity game. They're, they're going to be out looking to kind of sell shares a bit above VWAP. The next area above that is going to be high a day. Again, that is another big, big liquidity uh, area because every single long trader is chasing, hoping for that range break higher, hoping that we can uh, break out of that kind of uh, $5 and, and, and $4 kind of range and look to move higher, right? And so, I mean, the areas if I was shorting would be that kind of VWAP reclaim in around there. And uh, I would look to take some small around high a day and then add, add, add when we confirm like stuff at high a day. Um, and I mean, just because like the majority of these small caps don't break out of that five and four dollar range, right? They're always stuck there. They're always stuck there. So it kind of becomes a, a game of averaging, right? Where you just want to have a high enough average that you can survive the top of that range and stop out if necessary. But you just want to kind of survive the top of that range so that when we do break lower and we do break to the downside, you have a great average. You don't need to worry about these kind of pops all the way down. And if you want to nail and bail it or recycle all the way down, you know, go ahead. You still have a decent enough average from the top. But I mean, you want to have meaningful entries. I think that is the most important part, right? If you're just, uh, you know, adding into a pop because the stock popped, well, then you're going to end up getting fucked, right? Because it's not really a meaningful entry. Yeah, the stock popped, but it wasn't too like a meaningful area or a meaningful place with resistance on the chart, right? But I mean, if you look at what all these small caps do every single day, it's really just the liquidity game where they'll, they'll move the stock a bit above VWAP because they, they know every single long trader is like, wow, that's bullish. Wow, that's amazing. You know, if I was a market maker, I'd be selling shares right above VWAP because that's where all these longs are looking to chase. They're like, man, uh, bullish, bullish, bullish. And then they get stuffed on yeah. and then the stock tanks lower, right? Same thing with high a day. Everyone's like, wow, we broke high a day. This is going to the moon, going to the moon, going to the moon, right? If I'm a market maker, I'm selling shares, selling shares, selling shares, selling shares, tank it. Oh, well, sucks to you, right? It's just really areas where you can take advantage of uneducated long chasers as a short that can that can really make you a lot of money now obviously if we have broke high a day and we're supporting and we're kind of propping all the way up and we're propping 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 and then we get that move higher well then that thesis is wrong but when we snap high a day or we snap vwap and we're just kind of stalling and holding it around there you know that's probably an area where people are uh you know bigger players or institutions or whatever market makers are looking to to sell shares so i mean if i were you that's what I would be focusing on, those kind of liquidity areas where people are looking to, to, to sell shares, institutions are looking to sell shares, bigger players are looking to sell shares, and just take advantage and ride along with them, right? Yeah. I like that. For, like, yeah, for broken day ones, that usually is, like, where I would be entering. Uh, like, in a way, I kind of don't really want to see it get above VWAP if it is really deviated from there. So I kind of like, I will play it differently to where I want to get like the majority of my size as close to VWAP as possible, just so I can get like really good risk reward. And then uh, I'll have a stop, maybe two cents above VWAP for half my size. And then a second stop at the closest line to VWAP from the upside, because you see all these moves that happen uh, you know, we'll stuff VWAP and then it will reject almost immediately. Um, and we won't, like, if I was scaling it, then I wouldn't be able to get uh, full size in there. You know, I might get like 25% on. So it's kind of just come to this point where I have done that and, like, my, like, it has kind of been one to one risk reward, which is just, for me, is kind of a bit too stressful of a way to trade. So it's really just been about, you know, 
picking those liquidity areas uh, pre-market and really, really thinking about like which one should it not reach? Because of course, you know, we don't want it to reach pre-market high of day, but at the same time, a lot of them don't even make it near it. So it's really just, you know, if it is super deviated from VWAP uh, at the open, then I'll look to enter as close to VWAP as possible. But if it's, you know, opening up really close uh, to VWAP, you know, maybe like 10, 15 cents away, uh, that's when I'll take an entry at a mid to outer line, risking around the outer line, depending on, uh, yeah, like the, the liquidity in the pre-market. Yeah. I like that. No, I, I, I like that you now have like a process. And I think that a lot of guys are going to listen to this episode and like relate. They're going to say like, I had the same issue. I oversized, I fucked up early. So I, and now you found like something that works for you. You have a process, you can articulate it. And I think that's key. I think everyone should be able to articulate their process. And I like that you now have confidence in your setups and you can kind of banter and have conversation with other traders who do the same. And like, you know what you're doing. So it's cool to watch you progress and, and would love to, you know, have you back on in the future too, and kind of keep going. Cause like, I like noting your progress, like slowly over and over. So I really appreciate yeah. it. I know we are getting near the open here, so we're going to wrap yeah, it up. Sure. But dude, thank you so much for coming on. This was awesome. Um, I really hope that a lot of new guys kind of take this into account that like you are not alone if you've made some like mistakes. Um, you know, there's always a path to kind of like redemption. So thank you again, man. Um, we will yeah, we'll do this again sometime. Perfect. Of course, Thanks dude. Of course. All right, boys.